Well, this is uh, <laughs> me, That's my brother Mark. Mark's on the left, I'm on the right. And we uh, joke about being 2P trading, and that's two Polacks. We're uh, both Polish, <laughs> at least by, uh, by at least 50 percent. So we we joke about that. So, so um, I uh, essentially try to map out a strategy for my financial plan each year at the beginning, and um, primarily because I trade. So this is my sole source of income is my trading. So uh, it's important to me to think about it like a business and to have targets in place because I have a comfortable lifestyle that I'd like to maintain. So um, this is kind of how I think about it. I put together a financial plan, and that kind of gives me an overall perspective on where my expenses are, where my income comes from, how much income I might, might need, and then how I might allocate my assets in order to, to achieve the, the income. My strategy basically is to cover my annual living expenses and as a primary objective and then secondarily to grow my net worth if I can, and that's the gravy. So I focus on income. Uh, I landed on options as a strategy to generate income after first trying to trade futures. Way back in the day, of course, I was an IBD a student, so to speak, and followed their strategy of buying growth stocks. And that was reasonably successful, but it's an up and down strategy. And I have come to learn that buying long stocks is actually one of the riskiest types of trading to be involved in. And so I've found myself appreciating the uh, sort of non-directional aspect of, of options trading, and uh, that's how I focus my attention. So from my income plan, I break down my capital to various allocations, and then I uh, map out uh, written trade plans for each of my trades. And I, I know that those are the, you know, essentially the hallmarks of a successful trader is a little bit of planning and being specific about what it is you intend to do. So this is how I break down my capital. Uh, I use this kind of equilateral pyramid or equilateral triangle pyramid idea, and I don't know why I like that, but it just works for me. So the foundation of my uh, allocation is based on essentially passive long-term investments like stocks or ETFs or mutual funds, things that they're primarily intended to be long-term no-touch or relatively no-touch investments. I won't say that I don't move money around to try to and maximize that, but I don't, I don't fret over it much. So then I break down uh, the rest of my capital into what I consider to be medium-term active investments, those are options, and then short-term speculative investments. And it's sort of interesting that when you break this into thirds, it comes out to be about 50%, 33%, and 17% in terms of capital allocation. And then if you go a step further, I'll, I'll go two slides ahead. Essentially, if you lop off this base and you take this and this together, as far as my options trading is concerned, this is about a 70% allocation to medium-term trading and 30% allocation to speculative or short-term trading. And I'll go back over this part of the slide uh, after I touch on this slide, which is a lot of words. I appreciate that. But essentially what it says is that, and this is quoted directly, this is a cut and paste right from my financial plan. So my income plan, I have a targeted return for the entire portfolio of 30%. Each section is targeted return that contributes proportionately to the overall return. So I'm going to generate different returns within each of these categories, and I know that. And so if you can identify historically what you're capable of generating from these categories, then you can roll it up into a, an income target. That's essentially what I do. So of the 2% portfolio returns 55%. So what I'm looking to get out of these passive long-term investments is a 5% return. That's you know not unreasonable to expect, although you know, depending on how things have gone, if you were just set it and forget it in long, uh, long mutual funds this past year, you probably didn't achieve that. Uh, the 
uh, portfolio section, I expect to get 28% return. And that's based on my historic average of generating income from primarily high probability iron condors. Uh, that has uh, rolled up, uh, at least historically for me, into a, a roughly a 28% annual return on overall capital. That's not return on capital invested, it's return on overall capital, because obviously you hold some back for, um, for reserve. So the most speculative portion of my portfolio, about 17% of capital overall, 30% of my trading capital, I expect to generate 100% return. And those three, math-wise, add up to a 30% return. So that's essentially how I approach the planning process. And um, I'm expecting that that 30% return will more than cover my living expenses, et cetera. So this slide essentially breaks down how I'm going to think about my trade types within my trading capital. And I credit this graphic to Doc Severson of the Options MD program, a program that I did take to learn options trading. And he, like uh, Dan, is an advocate of uh, iron condors, along with some other things. But his, the philosophy here is that non-directional index trading is should be the foundation of your trading for income because it's the safest. It's the easiest to manage. Indexes versus stocks, because indexes don't have single stock risk, which we've all heard about. Semi-directional index trading is the same concept. It's just sort of um, kind of what we've been doing with leaning uh, with, say, the flat fly toward uh, a one or, or the, um, I guess, some of the other trades that I've seen around the Sheridan community where you have more risk on one side than the other because you have a directional bias. And then there's the directional index where you're simply placing a bet that it's going to go one way or the other. And then the most risky investment and therefore the least amount of capital allocated is directional equities, which is counterintuitive to the IBD method because I, I actually cut my teeth on, you know, the foundation of my portfolio being directional equities. So I've changed my philosophy throughout the uh, year, actually since I've become a full-time trader, and uh, that's essentially how I think about my trading. Hey, Steve, there was a quick question. Are, are you set up as an official trading business, have trader status, or how do you handle that? Um, I... I actually technically am. I don't have an entity formed, uh, but I do try to seek trader tax status. So if if this is essentially how I'm going to approach this trading, I'm going to be looking at 70% uh, medium-term trades and 30% short-term trades in terms of capital allocation. And again, we're trying to generate a 30% or 28% return in this bucket over here and 100% return in this bucket over here. Um, it's good to have goals. That's all I'll say. Um, so the, the primary trade that I have been using to generate income over the past couple of years has been a Russell high probability iron condor. So what I'll do is I'll take and look at uh, using monthly options only, I'll take uh, a larger, the largest chunk of my capital and apply it there regardless of how many contracts it requires that I uh, manage at that point because it's, it's my attention to generate X amount of income from that particular trade. It's been my most reliable trade throughout the years, and I, I'm comfortable with it. I'm thankfully, uh, after joining the Sheridan community, Last fall, I'm learning some other trades, and I really do appreciate that. Interesting about the Sheridan community, I, you know, I sort of developed my own routine of generating income through these methods, and particularly the iron condor. And I was, not, I guess, not surprised, but just pleased to realize how aligned I was with the, the Sheridan philosophy of. You know, picking a few things that you know, doing them over and over again until you get good at it, uh, getting comfortable with it, and considering it a craft that you're trying to develop and get better at. Uh, that all just works for me. 
Uh, if you're going to bang out consistent income from your trading, you have to be focused. And you, uh, if you're trying this and trying that, and, and uh, hit, listening to this guy and listening to that guy, and, and and doing, you know, trying all the little things and never quite spending enough time on it, then it's hard to actually achieve your goals. So, so the high prop condor is number one. Uh, the broken wing butterfly is, or the iron butterfly on the SPX on a long-term trade is my number two. Uh, lately, I've very much liked this flat fly that Mark has been an advocate of. It's just an, it's sort of a, an aberration of the, the t traditional at the money uh, butterfly, but, uh, but I like it. And then I also use a rut or SPX double diagonal and a rut or SPX monthly calendar. So those are the sort of longer term trade choices. I'm comfortable with all four of these. I know them, I know how to manage them, and I use them over and over again, and then I track my performance. So on the short term side, I took Dan's class on weekly calendars back, I think in 2014, early 2014, because I had, I had become comfortable with the monthly iron condors and other similar trades but I was sort of looking for something to give me a quicker hit, to expand my knowledge base, and to, you know, give me a sort of a better return on capital. Um, the high prob condors, you have a lot of wait time for them to develop. You're in the trade a long time. At the time I was trading these, I was actually holding them to expiration uh, probably 95% of the time. So there was a lot of downtime, and I was looking to expand my knowledge base, and I, I did. I, I really enjoyed Dan's classes on both the double diagonal and the weekly calendar. I learned the weekly calendar at that time and started practicing it. It was very, very successful, particularly throughout 14 and the first half of 15, as we pretty much all know. Uh, since then, it's been mm, harder, and um, I've experiment a little bit with a 14 day to uh, uh, you know to sort of give yourself a little more wiggle room in terms of adjustments but um, it's still been a bit challenging with the increased volatility the size of the candles these days uh, the other trade that I've become comfortable with is uh, a Google or an Amazon iron butterfly on a weekly using weeklies and I'll go through what I do with that I like Google and Amazon primarily because they're high price stocks and highly liquid options I have dabbled with earnings trades, and I like to use some of my speculative capital for that. It sort of depends. I've tried everything from, uh, you know, 2x standard deviations iron condors to iron butterflies and uh, also uh, earnings calendars where you uh, buy the weekly options that are expiring the week of the earnings announcements and you sell something in prior to that that decays and, and goes away before uh, options or before income or <laughs> before um, uh, earnings are announced. Uh, and then traditional options on stocks directionally, uh, just essentially buying in the money calls in a situation where I have a good feeling about a, a move that's about to happen, et cetera, do very, very little of that. So are there questions that I should address at this point? Uh, no, I mean, you've got it. Uh, that's the only question has been so far, which are you an official trading business? Okay. And then you mentioned who did it. Somebody said they'd heard of them. And how is that? You're doing Good. great. This All has right. been one of the better presentations of a vet's day I've seen in a while you're doing. I think this is great information everybody can learn from. Great. That was my That was my hope. All right, so the high prob iron condor. Uh, how I do this is really very similar to what uh, to what's taught at the Sheridan community. Uh, I have made some iterations to this throughout the period of time I've been trading it, uh, but essentially I use monthly options in the rut. I enter 40 to 55 days to exp expiration. I pick delta 10 or less. I use 10-point wings. I didn't put that on here. I use a profit target of 80% of the credit, which is a little different than what is taught at, in terms of the Sheridan plan of uh, trying to achieve a 10% return on capital invested or net margin. I 
we used to we my brother and I um, used to use uh, more of a delta five or six entry, which is way out of the money. And I learned that from Karen, the super trader, and her her strategy when she started uh, to achieve any kind of a reasonable credit in that scenario. You have to use wider wings than ten points. So I started with 20 point wings and then added and then went to 30 point wings. So I was comfortable with that strategy. It was allowing me to virtually never adjust the, the positions. Uh, they would go along I and mean, I would literally carry them all the way to expiration. And that was great, but of course, because of that, you can only deploy half your capital. Because essentially, if you're 55 or 50 days out, you're you, you don't have another monthly that's close at, at the time that your options expire. So that was um, an interesting approach. What we, what my brother actually pointed out as we started looking at this is that you get a fairly steady decay of premium until the last couple of weeks. And we were very often just sitting on, you know, ten cents, twelve cents, you know, and it would just sit there for two weeks. And we thought, well, gee, what if we, you know, took eighty percent of the credit, and that was sort of my ballpark number, and you know, how could we deploy the capital to a newer trade that would be decaying more premium per day faster than this sitting on these, you know, trades that have pretty much run their course. We found that that was, in fact, the case. So that allows us to increase our overall return on capital number uh, by taking profits sooner. Still like the idea of waiting to the 80% credit, um, still getting a feel for it, but we've been doing it for probably the last six months, and it's been a, a successful strategy. Um, our adjustment points are pretty standard. Um, I, if we're entering a delta 10, I usually start looking at the adjustments at about 18. I'm a, a little more aggressive than I used to be, um, and then that's what I like. Um, 18 to 20 deltas, it's about 10 points above your entry. That's you know fairly conventional in terms of, of the adjustment points. The method of adjusting is simply to roll. Um, and then I have a hard exit at delta 35, uh, and that's sort of no question to ask, just G GTFO, as they say. Um, on the SPX broken wing butterfly, uh, I have been trading the flat fly lately and very much like it. We enter 30 to 40 points below the money. Uh, oh, 30 to 30, 40 days to expiration. So above 30, below 40 seems to be a comfortable sweet spot we've identified. Uh, we center 40 points below the money. 50 point put wings and 25 or 30 point call wings, whatever will allow us to get about 10% guaranteed profit in the upper wing. We adjusted the lower break even by adding a second fly. So we have decided not to make an interim uh, hedge, so speak, on the way down. Obviously, this is a, a, a trade that as the market falls, it loses money fairly quickly, but we found through some back testing that we're comfortable that if we can wait till the break even, put on a second fly, that we will virtually almost we will virtually always be able to make the trade profitable. Uh, we have a profit target of 10%. Uh, we're sometimes willing to take less because uh, not unlike the high prop condor, we've identified that there's a certain point that the trade will accelerate in profitability too, and then it will pause. And obviously this is dependent on market conditions, but we're not afraid to pull the trade uh, off a little bit early, less than our target profit, and just move it on to, to another trade. And primarily because we have had a high success rate. So if you're taking 10% profit and taking 15% losses, there's an assumption that there's a proportion of wins over losses here. You know, at about 60-40, this starts to fall apart and, and you can get into trouble. 
So if you're taking 8% profit and still taking 15% losses on a 60-40 basis, you're not going to necessarily be profitable throughout the year. But our success rate on this particular trade has been 90 plus percent. So that allows us to take a little less profit in certain opportunities. That's just how we think about things. So the double diagonal is a uh, positive Vega trade. It's a slightly, uh, it's a slight alternative. And what what I try to do is uh, deal with the double diagonal or the monthly calendar as an alternative to an iron condor, at least proportionately when the volatility is skewed dramatically in one direction. So if we have the RBX, you know, under 18. 16, something like that, that's pretty low on its historic range. And the likely next move for volatility is up from there. Obviously, we don't know when or how long it will stay at that low level. But if you're looking at probabilities, the probability of volatility expanding at that point is higher than, than not. And so a double diagonal or a calendar that benefits from increasing volatility can be helpful. So I use Rudder SPX. I enter 30 to 35 days to expiration. I prefer monthly options because of the liquidity. I enter my shorts 25 to 28. This, again, is traditional uh, as taught by the Sheridan community, as I understand it. I enter longs uh, 20 puts. Uh, 20 points out in the next expiration. I like to use monthly, so this is a month apart. I uh, will roll up the spreads at delta 16, take advantage of the uh, profit, and then I'll roll out shorts when the uh, at the money price reaches my short strike. I'm shooting for 10% profit, 15% loss. Uh, we'll reduce the profit target if I've had to make adjustments. That's just logical. I think we all kind of think to do that. So uh, the monthly calendar, uh, real simple. Uh, I enter at, at the money uh, using the rudder SPX, 30 to 35 days out. Again, I prefer monthly options. So you can see that these trades kind of come around at a certain frequency because when the next expiration is at 30 to 35 days, I'm starting to think about putting a trade on. I prefer the monthly options for liquidity. Again, it's not that you can't use the weeklies from the SPX. I've done that. It works. It's not a problem. Uh, but it, obviously, you have some liquidity issues sometimes. But since you're close to money, it's close to the money, those options are far more liquid. Uh, puts or calls, depending on the bias, sometimes um, if I'm you know, trying to position it just, uh, just below the money, I'll use puts. If it's just above the money, I'll use calls. It doesn't really matter, uh, you know, really it's just a matter of the, the cost of the debit, but they, they all seem to perform just fine either way. Uh, I turned it into a double calendar at the break even. That's a traditional uh, adjustment method. Uh, it depends month to month how I feel regarding the market, how aggressive I am. If I'm using my full allocation of capital, then I will sell half and buy the double calendar with the, the, the funds from that half. Uh, otherwise, I will double the amount of capital invested with a double calendar. I close my first calendar at the second break even. Actually, you know what, That's I, I wrote that wrong. Um, I will close the second calendar as is taught, I think, by the Sheridan community when the at the money price reaches my, uh, my short strike. And then I'll reposition it at that point. In other words, I'll take the first one off and I'll buy more of the at the money calendar, whether that's you know at the exact strike as the previous calendar or you know five points either way, uh, if I have enough room in the trade to make that worth the investment. And then I'll target 10 percent and 15 percent. Uh, this has been a pretty good trade. It's pretty easy to manage. Um, so that's essentially what I do for my, my medium trades. Just to go back, so Rudd High Probability Iron Condor is my go-to. The SPX Broken Wing Butterfly has become a secondary go-to. 
the double diagonal works and the monthly calendars work primarily when you have a situation where you think that you're going to benefit from expanding volatility. So the short-term trades, I learned this RUT weekly calendar from Dan's weekly calendar class, and I started trying it, and I liked it. It was very successful, pretty easy to manage, and when we were in la-la land during the first last half of 2014 and the first half of 2015, it was a, a big, big generator of, of income. Um, the return on capital is phenomenal. It, you're in the trade for a very short period of time. I, I liked everything about it. Since the end of June, when the market started to get a little bit funky and then into the late fall, when we had all the ups and downs, it's been a harder trade to manage, and I've sort of backed off from it for now. And instead, I am more of an advocate of uh, trading this flat fly using weeklies and trying to get a, a, a quicker hit where you're not in the trade for a long period of time, and, but you're benefiting from the uh, theta decay that's, that's fairly rampant in, in this, even at 30 days out. So I'll go over the trade. Uh, you, buy, you sell nine days out, you buy 14 days after that, whatever that is, using weekly options. Uh, I will always use the RUT. Uh, I made a double calendar at the break even, just like the other one, closed the first calendar at the short strike of the second calendar. Consider doubling at the money if you can, if, just depending on the days remaining in the trade. With a nine-day trade, you often don't have too many days left. Uh, if it's you know, when's, if I put it on on Tuesday, which was tr traditionally the day I'd put it on, if I, it was Wednesday and I needed to make the adjustment of the double calendar, uh, that's fine. If it was Thursday and I was already in a situation of having to close the first calendar, I probably would go ahead and make the, sec the, the double the at the money calendar. Just sort of depends on, on the strategy. But if it was past Friday, I, I definitely would not do that. If you only had four days left to expiration, I wouldn't do that. Oops, considering uh, doubling at the money, that's, uh, we just talked about that. So, again, 10% profit, 12% loss. A little bit less loss here because uh, these were not as consistently a winner. They were sometimes a struggle to manage, but so I, we put a little bit tighter rein on that one. Uh, the Google or Amazon Weekly Iron Butterfly. Um, not sure where I picked this up, but I like it. Uh, we entered two weeks to de to expiration using weekly options. Uh, these are both very li uh, very um, liquid options and uh, high price stocks, so the premium generated is pretty substantial. Uh, that makes adjustments easier, etc. Sell at the money, 20 point wings. Sometimes we split the short strikes. So if you're at you know, 665, I might do a 660, 670 short strikes, uh, sometimes a little bit even wider. It turns into sort of a, a real narrow iron condor looking thing, but still 20 point wings. Uh, this gives you a little bit wider break even if you do it that way, and it doesn't cut down the credit all that much because it, all this close to the money options are very high priced. So the strategy is to roll out the short strikes. Uh, when you're three to five points inside the break-even to reduce the delta. So if the price moves and you're approaching your break-even before you get there, we would go ahead and roll out a short strike to reduce your delta. By how much? More than 50%, uh, depending on the rapidity of the movement and the market conditions, et cetera, sometimes we would try to reduce it even more. Um, the other thing to note here is rather than roll up the put side, or the call, or roll down the call side if you're at a break even, uh, you can close and reposition the thing. So if you're two weeks out and you get a quick move, it sometimes makes more sense to just pull the whole thing off, take a breather, and put the thing back on, even with the same expiration at, um, you know, if there's enough days to expiration left. And I have become an advocate of that. I like it. Uh, if the market's moving fairly slowly and the stock is moving not because of any news, et cetera, then rolling out your short strike it can be 
a, a fairly easy way to make the adjustment. It works. Um, everything sort of reverts back in terms of price, so that can work. And then we target uh, 10% and 12% again. So on these shorter-term trades, we're giving them uh, a tighter leash in terms of the uh, time to get out. So, so that's how I trade. It's that simple. Um, it's not complex, and uh, keeping it simple and doing the same things over and over again and working at your craft to try to understand it and get better is uh, my mantra, and uh, that's why I joined the Sheridan community after, you know, I, I um, attended the reunion last year for the first time, and I was excited about it. It was fun to be a part of that community, but I wasn't a Sheridan student at the time, so I didn't understand all of the rich uh, information that was available by being a student of the Sheridan community. And I got a call from Dan, of course, after the uh, reunion, and he said, Steve, you know, how you doing? I don't really know you, but, you know, you, you came to the thing, and how are you doing with your trading? And I said, well, gee, Dan, I'm doing pretty good with my trading. You know, things would be going pretty good. He goes, well, you know, you got to plan for war at times of peace, right? And I said, well, yeah, sure. He goes, so, Steve, do you think that there's – uh, for the small amount of money that I charge for mentoring, do you think that there's anything I might teach you that would save you that investment in the long term? And I went, boom, light bulb went on. I said, <laughs> yes, Dan. I said, sign me up right now. Thank you very much. So I'm really pleased to be a part of the community. I think it is awesome, and I i would be surprised if I ever leave. And so that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. 